Good evening, and we're here with uh, General David Petraeus, Chairman of KKR Global Institute, former Director of the CIA, and one of the most decorated and respected generals in U.S. history. Sir, thank you very much for being here tonight to support the children of fallen patriots. It's a privilege to be back, thank you. And I mean that, it really is, and you know, that check is a symbol of all that you are doing, uh, and it will be much more, obviously. Uh, that check alone is probably enough for at least two or three children of fallen patriots, one year tuition, um, if they can get to a state school. If not, we'll get them money for Harvard or Princeton. Absolutely, sir. We couldn't have done it without you, though. Between you and what uh, your wife, you know, Holly Petraeus does for this charity, with other board members like the Colonel, we really appreciate your help and everything that you do. So uh, we're gonna start to uh, talk a little bit about you now. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about your father, uh, who was a Dutch sea captain, and in my view, played a big part in the war effort. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, my dad was born in uh, the Netherlands, uh, up in Friesland, where they're particularly stubborn and sturdy and determined and blunt. Uh, he was born and raised there. He went to the Dutch version of the Merchant Marine Academy. And he was actually sailing on a Dutch ship, I think down in the Caribbean or somewhere like that, uh, when the Nazis overran Holland. They couldn't go back to Rotterdam, uh, so they came back up the eastern seaboard, went into the Brooklyn Navy Yard and say, you know, anybody needs some sailors? And they did. So the U.S. Merchant Marine was very much in the hiring mode at that time. And as we found out later on, they desperately needed those, those sailors, those merchant marines because the Nazis were sinking the ships uh, so fast. They could, we could actually make the ships. We were pumping out a Liberty ship, uh, eight or 10,000 tons displacement, which is what my father eventually was the captain of at the age of 29. And the sole reason was because they were sinking crews faster than we could replace them, even though we could replace the ships. He did a run to Murmansk uh, when he was a captain of a ship it took months to do it because they crept up along the coast trying to stay within air power. But ultimately, they had to go north of Norway and they lost the air power there and a German battleship and U-boats got loose in their convoy and half the ships in the convoy were sunk. Basically, the escorts who couldn't go toe to toe with the battleship said scatter. Uh, and that's what they did. Uh, his ship made it, they made it back safely, obviously. He met my mother who was uh, helping out with the war effort at the uh, Siemens Institute in Brooklyn, uh, met and married, and then sailed for a number of years after that on merchant ships uh, after the war, the booming period. But they wanted him to sail 11 months straight and get one month off. And uh, after a number of years of doing that, uh, and had, hadn't had a son uh, born yet, uh, so they settled about 50 miles north of New York City uh, in a Cornwall Bay just around the corner from West Point, New York. Jack knows it well, uh, and, uh, and that's where they raised their family. Uh, we spent our whole time there. It was a wonderful place to grow up. Uh, and, uh, but he was a stubborn Dutchman, uh, and if I came home with something that you know, wasn't exactly at the standard that we both realized it should have been, he'd just sort of look me in the eye and he'd say, results, boy, results. And uh, that stayed with me for quite a while. So did some of the stubbornness, I think and some of the determination I'd like to think as well. Now, you grew up very close to West Point, I believe. And while you were there, when you were a young man, uh, I believe it was baseball, you acquired a very unique uh, nickname. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, a nickname came from when I was playing Little League Baseball. And the very first time I came to bat, uh, you know, they have some young, young guy up in the booth who is announcing. And, said, now at, at bat, pinch hitting for so-and-so is, is David P -P 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 Peaches. And uh, for the rest of my life, actually, still with my West Point classmates, that has stuck with me. Uh, again, I went to school seven miles away. I, the coach of our high school soccer team was a retired colonel who had actually won the national championships coaching at West Point. We had a number of West Point former faculty teaching in our high school. Uh, and the word went over there. And then, of all things, when I was a new cadet in New Cadet Barracks, Beast Barracks as they called it back in the day, 
Uh, there was a, a, a girlfriend of mine who was actually up at the cadet laundry as her summer job or something, and so she stuck notes into my laundry that would come back. And of course, that got intercepted. And one of them said, you know, dear Peaches, how's it going? And so for the rest of my cadet time, I had to, had to deal with that. Now, did anybody in the 509th, when you got to Vicenza, ever call you Lieutenant Peaches? Thank God, no. But, I had, but, <laughs> but there were two of my classmates there who did. But thankfully, by that time, I think other people were starting to learn that I had a different first name. <laughs> now, you had a full scholarship to a very good school, but you chose West Point instead. Why? Because of guys like Jack Jacobs. Uh, seriously. I mean, if you really think about why do you do stuff in life, um, I think it's sort of it's to be like Mike. And, you know, Mike, to me, was these sort of larger-than-life figures around the, the corner of Storm King Mountain, literally seven miles from my home. Uh, we actually did a lot of athletic competitions over there. West Point kindly used to let the Orange County Intercollegiate uh, League there use their stadiums and, and some of their tracks and so forth for the county meets. And we had a lot of glimpses of them. And, and I read about them. I was a newspaper boy, by the way, for two and a half years as a kid. You know, this is, this is good character building. Delivering newspapers on a two and a half mile newspaper route uh, in, in January and February in, in sort of middle state New York is a character builder. Getting up at five or 5.30 in the morning to have the paper on the door and the papers were full of stories, again, like those of Jack. Uh, I remember The Lonely End, Bill Carpenter, and, and, and all of this. And I, you know, deep down, I think I wanted to be like Mike. And again, Mike, to me, was a West Point cadet, and then the commissioned officers uh, that came out of that great institution. Now, at West Point, you went on a blind date, and that blind date changed your life. Well, I... I was uh, on the brigade staff as a senior cadet, uh, as a firstie, and that's a handful of students who are the top of the, sort of the chain of command of the U.S. Corps of Cadets. And a lot of the colonel's wives, and there were a bunch of them there in those days, would call us up, you know, on a Thursday and they'd say, hey, would you be willing to escort somebody to the football game? Oh, obviously a, um, a co-ed, a, a female college student, because they all had friends coming in. This is before there were women at West Point. And West Point apparently had some degree of magnetic appeal with some of the <laughs> neighboring girls' schools or something. In any event, so they'd call up and they'd say, and, but, and if you did that, then they'd bring you over to the house for dinner that night. So it was a pretty good deal. So I got a call one time on a Tuesday night, said, you know, you, are you free for the football game? And I said, sure, yeah, you know. Um, and I said, see if my classmate, she said, no, just you, uh, that's fine. And so I said, okay, yep, I am. And uh, then she said, you'll get instructions later on. And then I got instructions that the, my blind date was with the superintendent's daughter. So this is the three star. Uh, now to be candid, she thought she was being brought back to meet a, a nice young man that the, this colonel's wife knew who they'd been talking about. And that guy either got sick or got scared or something, I'm not sure what. Um, so I ended up sneaking around the corner and knocking on the back door of the superintendent's house, you know, a woman I hadn't met, uh, to take her up to the football game. Um, and, you know, we are both sort of looking out of one eye at the other, and actually as the game went on, and then I decided that a friend of mine and I would all go out, uh, he, he and his date and my, my now date, uh, and now my wife, and um, we had a great time, but we were originally, the deal was that we were just gonna stay out long enough so that it would be socially acceptable that I could take her back and drop her off at the soup's house, and then we were gonna go back out and really have a good time. <laughs> and as we were actually on the way back, you know, I said, why don't we just stop at this other place over there? And both of them looked back and, you know, what's <laughs> going on, and of course one thing led to another. Now. I took enormous ribbing. I mean, you have no idea. Uh, we tried to keep this quiet. It was sort of impossible to do that. I got very sensitive about it. I wouldn't allow the engagement to be announced until after the final chain of command selections for the cadets. I didn't want it to be said that he was a cadet captain because he was gonna marry the soup's daughter and all this stuff. And uh, again, it was, it was sort of merciless at times. Um, but, you know, eventually, um, we had the, the wedding. By the way, because we wouldn't announce the engagement early, we couldn't actually get a chapel reservation for a good 30 days. Normally, you know, they're lined up and they go hour by hour by hour. 
Uh, so 30 days we all reconvened uh, there at West Point and, and had a lovely ceremony and a, and a lovely time. Uh, and then we went over to Italy. Our first assignment was Vicenza, Italy, uh, and it was a glorious way uh, to begin a career and, and to begin a wedding, a marriage. When, the, when then Second Lieutenant Petraeus arrived in Italy, he wasn't famous then. I mean, what he was famous for was having one of the most attractive young brides uh, in Vicenza. Um, are you familiar with the song, uh, The General's March, sir? Yeah, there's a song that goes da 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 and 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 it's uh, and I've and so my classmates, when this would be played for the superintendent at West Point, we'd all be standing out there in the brigade staff. One of them would be singing, "My son-in-law, my son-in-law." <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah, there there was no shortage of, of ribbing. Now, when you arrived... Very creative in, ribbing, always. It was, was it? <laughs> so when you arrived uh, in Italy, uh, you spent two tours. I think you, you did your first tour, and then you... How did you, how'd you stay another three years? Oh, no, I stayed, uh, I stayed a bit longer, but I think it was uh, ultimately about three and a half years. Oh, three and a half yeah. total. Yeah. Okay. And then came back for the advanced course and so forth. Okay, because I left there in 77. Um, now, every, all of us who served and all the guys from the 509 that are here all have memorable moments or times. Mines, I mean, I think was uh, when we went through Checkpoint Charlie, when we did combat in the city, and then they took us through Checkpoint Charlie and we saw the other side. What was some of yours? Well, since you're the one asking it, <laughs> the memorable occasion was when his reconnaissance platoon um, got into a fracas with the parachute regiment of the UK. So we would go on these exercises where it would be the US versus the Brits on Salisbury Plain. And it actually got, it was more than competitive. I mean, this stuff got oh, downright, got downright nasty. And his platoon had decided that what they would do was change into civilian clothes and they would go to pubs and gather intelligence, or at least that was their story and they were sticking to it. Now the problem was, of course, they tried their best at a British accent, and at a uh, certain point in time, after a couple of drinks, I guess they weren't doing as well, and they slid back a bit. And all of a sudden, these paratroopers all said, you're bloody Yanks. At which time, these resourceful recon paratroopers pulled out bottles of mace and maced the paratroopers from the parachute regiment. Now. This may not sound too astounding for those who might have carried it through Central Park back in the bad old days or something like that, but this is a crime in the UK. <laughs> and not only that, they had carried it across international boundaries. And so this was a very serious diplomatic incident. And it actually also prompted a great deal of retaliation with when you would see the vehicles of the others or a lot of windshields knocked out. It kept escalating. We finally had to have smoke the peace pipe and get the exercise back under control. But since you asked, Tom. I remember that. I remember when they stopped the exercise because of that situation when it happened. And one of the recon uh, soldiers are right here over there, Joe Mancini. Very resourceful. <laughs> Actually, I will tell you another story from the old 09. Okay. That has always stuck with me. So this is when they were up in Germany and they were and you know, you have this 34 foot tower, you know, it has the steps that go up and at 34 feet off the ground, you hook these static, uh, the uh, uh, web that connects your parachute really, and you actually slide down and it gives you a sense of jumping out of the door of a plane, you go down, you bounce, and then you have to prepare to land and so forth. So one of the great American paratroopers back in that day, uh, he decided that he would and they were all, of course, mingling with the local population. And it was a lovely German girl that he had his eye on. And he said, you know, maybe we should go up and we could spend the night on the top of the 34-foot tower. Uh, this is really romantic up there. You, you won't, you'll love the view. So he went up and had, I guess, two sleeping bags that ended up being one. And uh, they had a lovely evening up there. Uh, and he drifted off to sleep. And all of a sudden, he woke up. And he heard down below, platoon halt, <laughs> right face. And he realized <laughs> that there was a unit about to up, come up the 34-foot tower. 
where they would find him and his German girlfriend. Um, and so, you know, we asked, so what did you do? We said, well, you know, we sort of got our stuff on and went out and sort of scampered on by them. And, uh, you know, said, salute, top of the morning, airborne all the way. <laughs> See, I expected them to jump off the tower with their harness and slide past them. <laughs> I think they were not fully clothed at that time, Tom. <laughs> oh, that was a very good one, sir. Um, <laughs> I never heard that one before. <laughs> you, you hang out at airborne reunions as long as I did, and you hear them all. Let's talk about your two near-death experiences. The first one where you got shot. So we were, uh, when I was a battalion commander in the great 101st Airborne Division, uh, we had very aggressive live fire exercises. In fact, this battalion was known for it. Actually, the division was. And uh, we had it, to, it was so good, Brigadier General Jack Keene, then the assistant division commander, later division commander, now four-star retired, and on Fox News a good bit, tremendous guy and an extraordinary mentor of mine over the years. He was with us, and it was a Saturday morning, and. What we would do is we'd literally get up at about one in the morning. We'd already be out in the field, and we've been doing this day after day after day. And you did a walk to daylight, it's called. So you, you road marched 12 miles, good rucksack, all your weapons and equipment and everything else. And then you'd immediately go into a, into a uh, actually a dry fire exercise. And then you, if you did that satisfactorily, you'd do a live fire. These were very, very uh, integrated with mortars and machine guns. Uh, we were throwing live grenades, which are very, very dangerous even in training. Uh, you had all kinds of supporting fire. You had targets out there that were popping up and so forth, uh, knocking out bunkers. And along the way in one of these, and Jack, General Keene was right next to me at the time, one of our soldiers went in, knocked a bunker out with a grenade, went in, sprayed it, and when he came out of the bunker, he tripped and fell down and actually stunned himself. He hit so hard. And we think he squeezed off a round. And, uh, and that round went right through my right chest, thankfully over the A in Petraeus rather than the A in US Army on the other side. Um, I used to joke and tell General Keene, you know, I had to have lightning fast reflexes to dive in front of that bullet and take it for you. Um, but it went right through and it kept on going. Uh, an enormous blast out of the back. Um, and, you know, I sort of staggered there for a second and then went down. And so it was the ultimate battlefield realistic training for our medics who truly did have to get an IV going right away and, and, and all the rest. Uh, medevac bird came out, thankfully, I didn't bleed out right away. It, it nicked an artery, did not sever it. If it severed it as it happened that same year, another battalion commander was killed and a Special Forces Master Sergeant was killed in live fires. Uh, and they got me to the post hospital. Uh, and they're really sort of a remarkable thing. The doctor looked at me and he said, and they're ripping everything apart, and he said, this is really going to hurt. And he takes a scalpel and without any kind of anesthetic at all, just cuts an X right down to the ribs and then jabs a plastic tube in that they have suction on and now if that's pulling, you're no longer going to suffocate on your own fluids and you're probably going to survive. Uh, then they put me back on a helicopter, flew me down to Vanderbilt Medical Center where one of the leading thoracic surgeons of America was. Um, and that was how I met Dr. Bill Frist, future Senate Majority Leader. As I used to say, jokingly, I was dying to meet Bill Frist. <laughs> anyway, so um, he, he you know, took care of me. And by the way, they're all looking odd at me. And I realize it's because I still had green camouflage all over my face. You know, I think they thought I was going into some kind of cardiac arrest. But Dr. Frisk gets me and he said, well, do you have any questions? I said, no, I don't have any questions. You know, let's do this thing. Because they're going to cut me open. They got to, you know, find out what's going on in there and get, pull the rib out that's been blown around and then staple you back, staple up the lung and then sew you all back up. He said, you sure you don't have any questions? I said, okay, well, where'd you go to college? He said, Princeton University. I said, fantastic, that's where I went, uh, did my, ma my master's and PhD. He said, which, which school? Woodrow Wilson School, that's a competitive major, only one in three even at Princeton get into it, that's really good. I said, how about medical school? Harvard, I said, let's go. Uh, so that was that, and um, 
and the, I was very, very fortunate, frankly. I mean, it is, is the bottom line, that it didn't do a lot of internal damage and all the rest of that. Now, with the, the surgeon, when the, after a couple of days you were in the hospital after the surgery, you wanted to get out of the hospital, and the only way he would let you get out when he asked you to uh, get down and give him 50 push-ups? Well, I mean, I was eager to get out of the hospital. I was a new battalion commander. I wanted to get back to my unit. I knew we had a huge exercise coming up, just massive, the biggest one in you know, recent history. Um, and it was going to be my battalion that actually changed the schedule, so we would be the ones that would do the exercise. And uh, so I wanted to get back at it, and I'd been doing laps around the hospital. Now I was back at the military hospital, putting all the tubes and everything else and just walking endlessly. And they were getting very tired of me bumping into nurses and doctors and everything else. And I said, I think I'm ready to get out of here. In fact, I said, you know, I'll, I'll show you. And I uh, got down and knocked out 50 push-ups and got up, said, you, is that good enough? Uh, and they, so they let me go and uh, finally. And, um, and by God, I was on that exercise 30 days later. Um, I could not carry a rucksack on this side, needless to say, but I carried it with one arm and, and it was an extraordinary exercise. Um, did big air assault to Fort Bragg, North Carolina after going to McCall Air Force Base and 82nd flew in and it was, it was terrific. The real question I have, I mean, with all this is, where did you, uh, where is that, uh, the trooper that shot you? Where is he stationed now? It's interesting, <laughs> so, so this is um, um, Specialist Smith. And I said, when I was still down in Vanderbilt, I, I got hold of the chaplain and I said, you need to find uh, Smitty and I want you to bring him down here uh, and I want to talk to him. And, uh, and I said, hey, big guy, no big deal. Everything is forgotten as long as you go to ranger school. <laughs> and he did. He went to ranger he school. He did, yeah. He also gave me, they made this sort of fake purple heart because, you know, you don't get a purple heart if your own soldiers shoot you. Uh, <laughs> So they took C ration, car C ration cardboard and they pinned a little purple heart to it, you know, with 550 cord, because I was a nut about tying everything down and OD tape and everything else. And they all wrote, you know, sort of silly comments on it. Um, <laughs> I, and I said to Smitty, I said, you know, Smitty, look, you know, if you're going to take a guy down, you got to do it with one shot, big guy. <laughs> you, can't, you can't be messing around like that. I could have gotten one off at you. So, but no, he's, he was a good soldier and, uh, just a freak accident that happened, as I said, and it turned out to be great. Now you had another incident during a parachute jump. This is actually, I was at the, I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I was on jump status, and I'd just been the uh, Divi assistant division commander of the 82nd Airborne and then the acting division commander. Now I was the core chief of staff, um, and I was seriously into skydiving. Uh, and I don't know how, for a show of hands, of anybody who's experienced free fall here, I mean, it is addictive. And, um, you know, I would, I had my rig in my car all the time, everywhere, you know, just in case, and you'd look at, see if the skies are blue when you come out of a building. Um, and, but, you know, you can push that too far. And, and we had a day where we'd, where we'd been doing more and more and more. And, we were into this stuff where you sort of pull very high speed turns right before you land, and then you sort of surf. So this is not where you're coming down floating into it. You're, you're trying to crank up the speed really high, and then you come out of it just above the ground, and you can literally surf back and forth and everything else. That was the big rage. If you're really good, you can actually hang your toes and then land. Anyway, so I did that, and I've been doing it that day. I think this is jump six or seven that day. And just as I cranked into the turn, I hit wind that was going up instead of horizontal. It was bouncing off trees. And my canopy dove. And from about 80 feet down, my canopy was leading me. That's not a good position to be in in a free fall. You want the parachute above you, not below you. And so it literally pulled me right into the ground and uh, fractured my pelvis front and rear. I was very lucky not to, not to be killed. Did a lot of damage. Um, inside and a whole bunch of other things and so and thankfully survived that and uh and they once again took me to a hospital and then ultimately i had to have uh surgery and i have a lot of plates and screws and all the rest of that in there um, but it it was good because it forced me not to run for six months that i was on crutches and all my other injuries healed up now did you ever jump again oh yeah so the next jump was a military jump still at fort bragg 
and uh, we decided we'd do it into a lake so that if I broke apart on, you know, when you actually exit the aircraft in the in, in military, the parachute's being pulled off your back, you know, there's a bit of an opening shock. And so we did it out of a helicopter, which has the least opening shock. Uh, and then if I broke apart, I wanted to land in a lake, not on the ground. <laughs> And so we had our water wings. It worked out terrific, and I, I did. And when I went, and I went from there, actually I went from there to Bosnia for a year, but I came back command of the 101st, and was on jump status again, and, and jumped uh, a number of times there before we deployed to Iraq, and then what was in, you know, just constant set of rotations to Iraq. Who was the general that told you not to jump again? So General Keene. General Keene called me up, and uh, he said, Dave, listen to me. He said, no more skydiving. I said, sir, uh, you give me a division, no more skydiving. He said, a deal. And it was the same division that he commanded, the 101st, where I'd also worked for him when he was the division commander. Awesome guy, absolutely sheer awesome. The only individual in the Oval Office with President Bush, uh, with, which had several other retired four-star generals and a noted uh, academic or two, the only one who said surge. Uh, a couple of the others said some more special forces, a couple others said more trained and equipped, some said give it up. He said, Mr. President, you got to surge. Um, and supposedly, according to more than just him, um, the President also asked, who should I send to command? Uh, and that, they did agree on that. Now, talking about the surge, a lot of people think, I mean, just by throwing a certain number of troops into the battle is what, you know, what wins it. No, the, the, the surge that, that mattered most in Iraq was not the additional forces. We added about 25,000 plus uh, American men and women in uniform to an existing force of nearly 140,000. Uh, and yet, as was mentioned earlier, we drove the violence down together with our coalition partners and, and Iraqi partners by over 85%. And uh, so that wouldn't have predicted that. The truth was the surge that mattered most was the surge of ideas. It was a change of strategy. Uh, every element of which was completely the opposite of what we had been doing. We had been consolidating on big bases, quote, getting out of the faces of the people as, as if we were part of the problem instead of part of the solution. We'd been handing off rapidly to the Iraqi security forces who had been so beaten up by the level of violence that they could no longer handle it. Uh, the level of violence was so high in the month that the president decided to surge, December of 2006, that there were 53 dead Iraqi civilian bodies due to violence every 24 hours. That's not soldiers, police, us, all the rest of that. That's civilians. It was out of control. It was on the edge of a full-blown, full-on civil war between Sunni and Shia. And what we had to do was get right in the middle of it, drive that violence down, get the bad guys. Um, and indeed, as you mentioned, we reconciled without question with tens of thousands. Ultimately, it totals something like 103,000. But the truth is we also went after the irreconcilables with unbelievably relentless, uh, every single night strikes. Um, and again, our our Navy SEAL and others were, were all part of this, we were doing between 10 and 15 high value target strikes every single night. These are killer capture raids. We wanted to capture, by the way, because you'd like to uh, be able to get to interrogate them without enhanced interrogation techniques, I might add, which I was against from the beginning. Uh, because if you want to get information from a detainee that's worth something, you actually become his best friend, as they say. Actually, you develop a relationship takes expert interrogators, linguists, patients, everything else. But that's how it's done. Uh, and so a combination of unbelievably relentless pressure at, at the senior leaders of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the Sunni insurgent organizations, and the Shia militia, and then reconciling with the rank and file, many of whom didn't really want to be doing what they were. They're just in the wrong place at the wrong time and intimidated. So we went back into the neighborhoods. You mentioned 77 additional locations just in the Baghdad area alone. Many more outside of Baghdad, mostly with our Iraqi partners. We took control back from the Iraqis. We rebuilt, reconstituted, retrained, re-equipped 
uh, the Iraqi security forces, hundreds of thousands of them. We did pursue reconciliation, which was just a tiny little uh, beginning when we started, and, and we wanted, I said, I want to hit critical mass on the Sunni awakening. This is Sunnis who are tired of Al-Qaeda doing what they're doing in their neighborhoods. They want to throw them off, but they need our help to secure their areas. But if we're willing to do that, they would stand there with us, uh, and that very much worked. And over the course of, again, the next 18 months, we drove violence down by 85% and gave Iraq a, a really extraordinary chance at a new future, having done it earlier, of course, during the invasion in 2003, in fact, as the commander of the 101st, and then as a three-star uh, in a subsequent tour. They, they made the use of that for a good three and a half years. Uh, those who say, well, the enemies, were, they were all tired of fighting or whatever, this is all nonsense. I mean, we defeated them, we destroyed Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and we destroyed the Shia militia. And tragically, three and a half years later, the prime minister with whom we'd done this, he'd been reluctant on some of it, but with whom we'd done it, and with whom we'd brought the fabric of Iraqi society back together, Sunni with Shia, everybody realizing that their incentive was to support the new Iraq rather than to oppose it. And unfortunately, he took highly sectarian actions that alienated the Sunni population once again, massive demonstrations put down violently, uh, and once again, you have a Sunni-Shia uh, incipient civil war, and in the midst of that, Al-Qaeda in Iraq is able to get back up on its feet, become the Islamic State, drifts into Syria, gains all kinds of new power, leaders, money, equipment, weapons, explosives, and, and fighters, and now it's winning, so everybody flocks there to help out with that cause sweeps back into Iraq and, of course, almost threatens the very walls of Baghdad until we could get back in, having pulled out uh, a couple of years earlier, uh, and then help them once again be get back on their feet and then help them defeat the Islamic State in its form as an army. There's still an Islamic State there in, in insurgents and terrorists, uh, but that's something that can be resolved. And it's really quite extraordinary that we were able to do it this time with a very modest sized U.S. force. And it's entirely because we built this incredible armada of an unmanned aerial vehicles uh, that can do the uh, intelligence gathering, the surveillance, reconnaissance, and then even do strike, precision strike, and also enable our uh, close air support that does precision strike. Uh, and even as all we're doing is the advice, the insisting, the enabling, training and equipping, but not the fighting on the front lines, and not many of the other tasks that we had to do when Ambassador Crocker and I were privileged to lead the surge in Iraq. And that's a very dramatic uh, shift and a very dramatic development. It's really a revolution in how we are fighting, and that's crucial, because as I was telling uh, Secretary Donovan earlier, this is a generational struggle. This is not the fight of a decade, much less a few years. This is a fight that's going to last for decades against Islamic extremists who uh, threaten our way of life and, and want to do us harm. Uh, and unfortunately, this is not a fight where you can find the right hill, take it, plant the flag, and go home to a victory parade. I fear that we're gonna have to continue to stay at it. And if that's the case, what we have to have is not just a sustained commitment, but a sustained commitment that is sustainable that's measured in the expenditure of blood and treasure, and I think we have actually figured out how to do that. Uh, it's not a satisfying, this is not a victory like Desert Storm, where again, you know, you've liberated Kuwait and you come home and parade through Washington. Uh, I don't know if there will be a parade uh, other than perhaps the one that will be ordered this fall uh, for the commander in chief. But um, that's necessary, I think, and, I, and it's uh, in a true tribute to those who have led and those who have been part of this particular uh, endeavor for the United States and our coalition partners. When you took over in Iraq as uh, the commander of Allied Forces there, you replaced uh, General Casey, is that correct? Yes, yep. Is that who, the same Lieutenant Casey? It is, Italy? it was Lieutenant Casey from the 509th and a Lieutenant Casey who was honored by children of fallen patriots because he is in fact a children, a child of a fallen patriot. His father was killed uh, in Vietnam when he was the commander of the 1st Cavalry Division, uh, shot down or, or, or had a, 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 either an accident or shot down in a helicopter. Uh, and so indeed, he, he 
went through life without the father that would have been there for him. And it was very meaningful uh, the year that he was the honoree of the Children of Fallen Patriots. I remember, I remember the, the, the name and then somebody mentioned yep. in the 509 Association that that's Lieutenant Casey from Vicenza. You had an incident with a uh, general, from uh, an Iranian general who was in charge of the Re Republican Guard, um, Soleimani? Oh, Qasem Soleimani. So Qasem Soleimani is the commander of the Revolutionary Guards Corps Quds Force of, of the Iran Revolutionary Guards Corps. Uh, that's essentially a cross between the CIA and special forces. They operate largely outside Iran. Uh, and they are the ones that were training and equipping and funding and directing the Shia militia that we defeated uh, in Iraq. Uh, then it's also Lebanese Hezbollah. And of course, he was the one who really uh, stiffened uh, the cause in Syria when the murderous Bashar al-Assad uh, was teetering the first time. Uh, he brought in Lebanese Hezbollah. He brought in Quds Force advisors. They brought in some Iranian soldiers. Uh, and then they brought in Shia militia from places like Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere in the region. Um, he never set foot in Iraq when I was the commander. Uh, I think he knew what might befall him if he had. Uh, but I got a communication from him during the Battle of Basra. This is in the second half of the surge. We'd always intended to focus first on the Sunni insurgents in Al-Qaeda and then to shift and focus on the Shia militia. Uh, and the Prime Minister of Iraq got impatient and impulsively he ordered two Iraqi divisions to go to Basra, the southern city in, in the oil-rich province by the same name down in, this, down in the port area of Iraq. Um, and they got into a big Donnybrook down there with the Shia militia before we could even get advisors and, all, and move our, the baseline for our aircraft and everything else and the communications and establish a command post because it was in the British division's area and they'd pulled their advisors out of Basra. That was a very near run thing. And in the middle of this, the president of Iraq, who was a Kurdish, longtime Kurdish uh, leader, um, unbeknownst to us, flew up into the Kurdish area of Iraq and slipped over into Iran and met with Qasem Soleimani, the Revolutionary Guards Corps. And then he went back into Baghdad, and I got a call late one night that said that the president of Iraq wanted to see me, so we cranked up the helicopter, flew across the city, landed at his helipad he had at his palace, and went in to see him. And he said, General, I have a message from Qasem Soleimani. I said, are you kidding me? I mean, we're battling his guys, and you went and met with the guy? He said, well, yeah, you know, maybe we figured we could broker peace somehow. And um, so I said, well, what do you say? He said, well, he said, General Petraeus, you should know that I, Qasem Soleimani, commander of the Revolutionary Guards Corps Quds Force, control the policy for Iran when it comes to Iraq, uh, Syria, Afghanistan, Lebanon, and Gaza, period. In other words, quit fooling around with those diplomats, you deal with me. And uh, so the president, asked expectantly, so what should I tell him? And I said, Mr. President, you can tell him to pound sand, because we're gonna defeat his guys, and we did. We actually destroyed the Shia militia. We really are Iraqi counterparts on the ground. We got advisors linked up with them so we could figure out how to bring our air power to bear and the unmanned aerial vehicles get in position. We didn't have anywhere near the capabilities that we have now. Uh, and ultimately, we, we did destroy them there, and that gave us license to go into Sadr City, from which they've been pounding us with 10 to 15 volleys of as many as 10 to 12 rounds per volley every single day during the, these battles. Uh, and then we defeated them there and then defeated them in a variety of other places where, frankly, we'd been itching to get into it with them. Uh, but there were political sensitivities because they're Shia, the prime minister was Shia, and he had to be sure of his political base. Uh, now, Qasem Soleimani has since become enormously prominent uh, in the region because he was the one, again, supporting Bashar al-Assad, kept him in the fight long enough for Russian air power to truly turn the tide. Uh, he's a big supporter of Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, he would love to see Iran be able to Lebanonize Syria and Iraq the way they did Lebanon. In other words, to take the Shia militia, the paramilitary that they have been supporting, and not only have muscle on the street, 
but have votes in the parliament. And that's what they have in Lebanon. They have enough votes, in fact, that it's a blocking veto if they need to use it. They'd love to achieve that uh, in Iraq, and they very much want to achieve it in Syria as well. It's a very dangerous development because this would solidify uh, what's called the Shia Crescent, which runs all the way from Tehran through Baghdad, Damascus, and then down into southern Lebanon, obviously threatening our ally Israel there. Um, and again, a very significant threat to the Sunni Arab countries uh, that are in the rest of the region. So this Iranian general sends you a message and you go tell him to go pound sand. Are you guys still pen pals? What's interesting is I sent him a couple of messages after that. Um, later on in the surge, uh, they started perfecting something that was essentially, it's very primitive. Um, essentially, a, it's a bomb that has enough force to just throw it over a wall. And it's got a lot of explosive and around it, it's got glued all kinds of basically metal crap so that it will explode and do an enormous amount of damage. It'll have nails, it'll have bit, bits of, of, again, uh, iron in it and all the rest. And it was quite lethal. Um, one of these went off by mistake in a Shia area where it was being constructed in Baghdad. And we were very concerned. Another one almost made it over the wall, did some damage, uh, but did not. And at that point, I. I had a way to get messages to him through another member of the Iraqi, the Iraqi parliament and uh, essentially said, sent him a message that if this happens again, there are going to be enormous consequences. And I don't think we saw it happen for a good three years after that. Your thoughts on uh, the future of Syria and President Assad? President Assad obviously is an individual who is uh, a murderous dictator, authoritarian leader um, of a sect in Syria that accounts for less than 15% of the po population, the Alawite slash Shia. They developed their Shia links when they needed money from Iran, the Shia power, to some degree. Uh, the majority of the country is Sunni, well over half, uh, and then you have population of Kurds and a number of others, uh, as well as some Christians and, and, and other different ethnic and sectarian groupings. Uh, when in the Arab Spring, the Sunni in Syria rose up uh, at the treatment of, of, that he had uh, administered and that his father before him had administered, another murderous dictator, um, Bashar al-Assad put it down very violently, peaceful demonstrations, and this sparked, of course, even more violence. And it ultimately led to a Sunni-Shia civil war that has also al-Qaeda, ISIS, uh, Syrian Kurds, and a number of other different participants. Uh, it appears that, that Bashar al-Assad has not listened to what some of our diplomats used to say, which is that there is no military solution in Syria. Um, that may be true from our perspective, but I occasionally reminded some of those who said that, that I wasn't sure that either Bashar al-Assad or Vladimir Putin, who ultimately was the ultimate uh, bailout and supporter for Bashar al-Assad when he put his air power in there. As I mentioned, uh, Qasem Soleimani, the Iranians, bankrolled and supported with a variety of different Shia militia, including Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, but it was teetering again, and that's when the Russians came in. The way they have taken control of areas is absolutely barbaric. Uh, use of uh, barrel bombs, essentially, huge barrels with a lot of explosives in, just dropped uh, or pushed out of aircraft, um, completely indiscriminate. Uh, causing a mass casualty exercise, getting all the first responders out and then bombing them, bombing hospitals, of course, using chemical weapons, and it was good that this administration, I felt, used force against them in, in two of those occasions, in the wake of two of those, and, but is going to bludgeon his way back to control uh, of a good portion of Syria, and then we'll have to see what happens with the area where our forces are still shoring up the Syrian Kurds and some of the Syrian Sunni uh, who have enabled the defeat of the Islamic State, by and large, there's still some pockets, uh, but by and large in the uh, eastern and southeastern parts of the country. 
Uh, at some point, there may be a political solution between the Syrian Kurds who may be given some degree of autonomy, say the way that Kurds in Iraq have. Uh, but there's a lot of conflicting interests in here. And this is the ultimate place where the enemy of my enemy may actually be my enemy. Uh, it is a very difficult set of cross-cutting interests and objectives and loyalties. Uh, our Turkish allies from NATO are there with some interests that at times are at variance with ours, at other times are very much the same. Uh, and it's going to require, I think, a degree of determination on our part to show that we're willing to stay as necessary in certain areas. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, people ask you, how should you deal with Vladimir Putin? How should you deal with this other thug? With firmness. And if you are not firm, they will keep on poking. Uh, it's like a bayonet, and they'll keep on pushing until it finally runs up against something that stops it. Uh, and I think that we've learned that lesson time and again. That's not, a, not a, you know, a call to be provocative. It's not a call to start another war. It's a call to be firm uh, and to show that we have interests that are unyielding and that we, will, we are determined to protect them. Now, with the Iran situation with the U.S. and Iran, you know, the tensions going up, the demonstrations going on in Iran, what do you see the future there? Well, there, we are going to have increasing tension between the U.S., the Sunni countries of the Gulf states, uh, and Iran. Um, the, we got a nuclear agreement, obviously. It has some very good features, and it has some, some bad features. Um, it got rid of all the, the uh, medium-enriched uranium, 99% of the low-enriched uranium. It ended the plutonium path to a bomb with cement poured into the reactor core, has reasonably intrusive inspections uh, regime, um, and it reduced dramatically the number of cent centrifuges spinning. But it didn't do anything to the missile programs. It has end dates associated with it. Uh, Iran got tens of billions of dollars uh, that had been frozen around the world. They regained access to that. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't know what comes after it. Uh, and that is very unsettling. Beyond that, I think there was a certain assumption that if we did a deal with, with Iran like this, that there would be a gradual uh, building of confidence between the U.S. and Iran and that perhaps Iran would show that by not conducting more provocative missile tests, uh, by not being as aggressive in their use of the forces that, again, Qasem Soleimani has been recruiting, training, funding, equipping, and directing. I mean, he took selfies on the front lines in Iraq with soldiers and in Syria, uh, also with some of these Shia soldiers. Uh, and again, unfortunately, the opposite was true of the hopeful assumptions which I think ultimately is what led this administration to say, let's pull out of the deal, let's reimpose sanctions, and let's really tighten it down. Uh, our European allies, the, the firms, the businesses in our European allies, and our allies were not keen to see us withdraw, and there's a case that could be made uh, for not doing that. Uh, but the businesses have no choice but to cease their operations in Iran because they have a choice. They can either do business with Iran or they can do business with the United States. And obviously, that's a pretty easy choice. So there will be very few legitimate businesses around the world, or at least international businesses, that will continue to do work with Iran. We will probably allow them to continue to export some oil, as long as the countries receiving it continue to reduce what they get. And some countries will be immune to this. China, for example, could have a corporation set up or a state-owned enterprise that doesn't need to do business in the United States and could therefore uh, continue with Iran. But it's going to be very, very tough on Iran. And it comes at a time when Iran has many, many demonstrations around the country because of unmet expectations, not just about what might follow if they had a nuclear deal economically and the opportunities, but also because they have squandered water. They have completely mismanaged. There are terrible water shortages. There are power outages. Um, the, the quality of life, instead of improving as they had hoped and expected, uh, has not been. Uh, it's been going down, and they know that their government is spending billions of dollars supporting Syrians, uh, Lebanese, uh, Iraqis, Afghans, etc., and not spending it at home. And on top of that, there's just horrific corruption. 
There's enormous distortion to the economy because of, again, the Quds Force and the Revolutionary Guards Corps being engaged in some 30 or 40 percent of the economy in a whole variety of different schemes. And so the, the country, it's no longer inconceivable, I don't think, that there could be the kind of upheaval that could actually result in some kind of uh, regime change. We say that that is not our object. Our objective is not to change the regime, it's to change their behavior. Um, but I'd never until this moment would have expected that see some of the cracks that are appearing. Because this is a regime, keep in mind, you've got a president, you have a parliament, you have ministers, Army, Navy, Air Force, but you have the deep state. It's a whole separate structure. That's the Revolutionary Guards Corps, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. It's the Quds Force. And it's the besieged militia, which is essentially nearly two million thugs who will go out on the streets and swing pipes and clear those streets if necessary. But one never knows when you reach the point where those in the deep state are stop being willing to hurt or kill fellow Iranian citizens, such as what happened when the Egyptian military refused to shoot uh, at the Egyptian citizens in Tahrir Square. No one knows where that moment is, but you certainly can see and feel uh, the very real uh, unrest that is percolating in many different places in a country that, not unlike Iraq, has many ethnic and sectarian and tribal centripetal forces. Um, and so this is one that we are going to have to watch very, very carefully and to manage to be firm and again, though not provocative. So what do you see, who do you see as the biggest threat to the U.S. today? Well, there's a number of candidates internationally and perhaps even at home. Um, you have revisionist powers that are not satisfied with the status quo, Russia, Iran, North Korea, even China. Uh, you have Islamist extremists that I talked about were engaged in a generational struggle. Uh, there are cyber threats now that could definitely keep you awake at night, not just nation state threats, Russian trying to undermine our faith in democracy, put a scale on the elections, not just here but in other countries as well. Uh, China stealing our intellectual property through cyberspace. Uh, Iran damaging infrastructure, 35,000 computers of Aramco in Saudi Arabia. You have criminals that are ever more creatively, diabolically creative, but you have extremists, and extremists are willing to blow themselves up on the battlefield to take us with them. I don't know how you deter them from hitting the send key uh, if they develop the cyber equivalent of a weapon of mass destruction. So that's a big concern. Domestic populism in many parts of the world is, is a concern. Uh, it's causing big challenges in a number of democracies, the UK with Brexit, Germany because of the Chancellor's agreement to take in a million refugees, uh, Italy where you have an uncomfortable alliance between the right wing and the left wing ruling the country and they agree on only one thing which is no more refugees, um, and the United States frankly with a certain degree of, of uh, hyper partisanship as well. Uh, there is a degree of stress and strain on the international order, the so-called rules-based international order, the institutions, the uh, multilateral organizations, the norms and so forth that have served the world in pretty good stead, uh, certainly since the end of the Cold War, arguably since the end of World War II. Uh, you know, they came in the wake of a 50-year period that had two world wars and the Great, Re Great Depression. And then frankly, again, to come back home uh, to the hyper-partisanship of Washington, D.C., which is preventing anyone from ever giving an inch uh, or compromising a little to get a lot. Um, and so you have a pretty good menu there, and on any given day, I think any one of those could be the cause for alarm. Uh, but I certainly hope that, that we can resolve our own challenges uh, and remove what might be termed the legislative, regulatory, and policy headwinds that have prevented us from fully capitalizing on the extraordinary opportunities we had by leading the world in the IT revolution, the energy revolution, the life sciences revolution, and the manufacturing revolution. We have a lot of opportunity. The economy is doing well, albeit to some degree because of some of the
deficit spending that has ramped up so dramatically with the tax cuts and the budget bill. But a lot of that is fundamental goodness. Uh, and what we've got to do is figure out how to keep it going longer uh, and how to ensure that, you know, in the decades to come, uh, that the country is postured to continue to lead the world in these different areas by ensuring the education of the workforce of the future, comprehensive immigration reform, infrastructure investment, smart tax overhaul, and all the rest of that. The, there's a young Marine here, Eric Harper, who uh, works for the uh, Fiddler's Golf Course. I think you met him before. Yep. And he, in October, I think he, he, he uh, handles a run through the golf course about 25, uh, 25, 28 miles and raises money for charities, which this year he wanted to help uh, with the Children of Fallen Patriots. Well, first of all, let me just say thanks and let's all support him uh, in that particular effort. Absolutely. Uh, and he, you know, when I mentioned to him about your uh, exercise routine and how, so he was asking me, I mean, what I what is your exercise routine every morning, and what do you eat in the, for breakfast? <laughs> so I actually uh, I sleep in now till 5:15 or so, <laughs> uh, and actually breakfast is a couple of cups of coffee with um, this kashi go lean oats or something like that with uh, skim milk, and then and a banana cut up on it, uh, and then I hit the, hit the gym or the Central Park or wherever it is that I am. Um, you know, we live in Arlington, Virginia, but I've got an apartment up on, on uh, Central Park South because of my position with KKR. Uh, and usually do some aerobic, either again, bike in the park, run in the park, bike or run in, in uh, the, the gym that's right next door. Uh, and then do another 45 minutes to an hour of a uh, combination of uh, strength, uh, flexibility, um, mobility, and that kind of stuff. It's a wonderful routine. Um, it's, it's worked pretty well over the years, a few injuries notwithstanding. Um, and, you know, it's a privilege to continue to do it at my advanced age. So for all those who didn't get a picture with Petra uh, General Petraeus, uh, you know every morning at Central Park he runs 6.2 miles. So that's where you can find him. <laughs> Now, uh, President Bush was in pretty good shape, and he once challenged you to a bike race. In the I thought he had lost his mind. <laughs> I mean, so he came home from the surge, and you know, the word came, the president liked to host you and your family in the Oval Office, so it was a very, very nice gesture, and sort of characteristic, frankly, of, of what he was like. And so he got in there, and you know, he's capable of talking a little bit of trash, and. I'm capable of talking a little trash. So he said, so General, why don't you keep ducking me in my offer to ride mountain bike with me? And I said, Mr. President, have, have you lost your mind? Do you, have, do you have a death wish? I mean, I said, I will do that. And I will give you something you can write off on your income taxes, education. <laughs> so I actually happened to be going out to Aspen for some gathering out there or something and uh, got a guy had got on mountain because I'm a road biker, not a mountain biker, but we got on mountain bikes, learned how to do it. You know, there's a lot of technical stuff. But, and so we went out there and we, I rode out with him that day and it was about an hour outside the Oval Office, or outside DC proper, uh, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, they'd taken and actually made a mountain bike course for him and it was built around fairly wide uh, fire brakes on which you could ride four abreast like NASCAR but then you'd have the funnel of death, and it would go down to single track. Secret Service all knew where these were. The other guys, all part of Peloton One, as it was called, they all knew where they were. I did not, and so I kept getting surprised. And the very first one, I wanted to stay right on his back tire. I mean, I was tapping it every now and then to make sure he knew, because I was told, don't pass the president. So I, I realized I wasn't going to be able to do that. But they actually, you know, it gets a little physical in there, because you're going all down. And, and so they actually pushed me one time, so I got back up, got on, caught up, and you know, had to push back. Our son broke his finger, actually. I mean, this is bumper cars out there. Yeah, he was riding with, he was an ROTC cadet up at MIT. Subsequently did eight years in the Army, uh, multiple tours in Afghanistan with the 173rd Airborne, a lot of representatives here, uh, and then the Ranger Regiment. He's now up at Harvard Business School and Harvard Law School, good kid. 
Uh, but so that, so we had to take him to Walter Reed Hospital after it was all done. We had a great ride. It was super. I was on his rear the whole time. Made them all do push-ups and flutter kicks when we got back. Uh, we rode back in with him, and then they had already called ahead to Walter Reed, so I, we took our son over there. That night, our son and I were out eating pizza together, and I got a call on the cell phone. Uh, and picked it up and said, please hold for President Bush. And so the president came on. He said, hey, put the dude on. So I put our son on. He said, how are you doing? How are you doing, Steve? And he said, just want to check on you, make sure you're OK. Uh, and again, it was sort of characteristic uh, of him. I, he had a wonderful personal touch. Uh, and it was really a privilege to be a commander under him. He did something no president ever did in history before, including him, or after. And that is, when he did the surge, we, all went, we went all in. And he did. And so every Monday morning, 7.30 in the morning, Washington time, with his whole national security team in the Situation Room of the West Wing of the White House, uh, he would do a video conference for an hour with Ambassador Crocker and myself. Uh, and it set the tone for the entire week in Washington. And if you want to show emphasis on something, you do it with your own time, especially if you're the President of the United States. And it was really a privilege, again, to be one of his soldiers in the field. Lieutenant uh, Stephen Petraeus, by the way, uh, became a paratrooper and was stationed at the same base where the General and I served with the 173rd Airborne. Vicenza, Italy. Vicenza, Italy. Great start to a career, although he immediately went to Afghanistan. And then he went and served and fought in Afghanistan. So there's a lot of young cadets here tonight, sir. Uh, what's your advice to them? That's an interesting question. You know, I, and you get this all the time. And you, know, you could give some trite advice about you know, work hard, keep your nose clean, do great at school, do lots of push-ups, run all the you know, I mean, it, this is. Um, but at the end of the day, what made the difference for me uh, was some advice that I got when I was a captain, young captain. And I was the aide for a great general named General Jack Galvin, ultimately was the NATO commander. Uh, I worked for him three times over the years. This is the first time. Uh, Jack knows him well because he was actually an ad, a, a, a distinguished professor up at the Social Sciences Department uh, years after uh, he left the service. And he, he asked me one time uh, you know, whether I shouldn't try to seek out of my intellectual comfort zone experiences. And he said, have you ever considered raising your sights beyond the maximum effective range of an M60 machine gun? <laughs> I said, why would I want to do that? You know, I mean, that's the organic longest range weapon in, a, in an infantry company. I mean, you know, if it's beyond that, that's why we have mortars or artillery or air force. Uh, I said that jokingly, but the point was there. And it was really, you know, you're a decent infantryman. You're probably, I don't know, 75, 80, 85% competent in that. You could go to this other way and you're gonna find out, you're gonna develop intellectual humility you're going to find out there's a lot of smart people in the world who don't see it through the same prism that we do. You're going to get out of the grind, grindstone cloister syndrome that we suffer in the military where you know, we're, our nose is to the grindstone. We always want to be working longer than our boss. Um, and we live a cloistered existence intellectually. It's not that we all see the world the same way at all, but generally, compared with a lot of others, uh, that is somewhat true. Uh, and that turned out to be incredible advice. Uh, Princeton University for me was truly an out of my intellectual comfort zone experience. Uh, I grew so much during that time. And frankly, I kept trying to do that beyond that. Uh, instead of going to the War College, I went and did a fellowship at Georgetown. Instead of fi finishing the fellowship at Georgetown, I did the spring semester abroad option by being the chief of operations for the United Nations Force in Haiti. So it was these sort of off-the-wall experiences uh, that really were crucially important to me. Years later, when I was in a coalition force in Bosnia, or certainly in Kuwait, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and the Greater Central Command, Middle East and Central Asia, I mean, it was those kind of experiences that I ended up drawing on, frankly, much more uh, than what I'd learned in some of the more professional military education courses. Don't get me wrong, you've got to be competent in your field in the military first. Um, I don't care how up to speed you are on international relations or macroeconomic theory if you're not a competent infantryman. But if you can get beyond that point, this other stuff really becomes very important. 
And I remember somebody came up to Mosul and they said, you know, why is, what's going on up here? How, where did you learn this stuff? What, I learned it in, actually in political philosophy. I learned it in, again, uh, macro and microeconomics. And all we were doing is very simplified versions of that. Uh, but that was what it was. Um, you know, they said, are you inspired by MacArthur? MacArthur, goodness, he, I mean, he rewrote the Constitution of Japan. I'm just an infantry division commander. I'm sort of inspired by Rudy Giuliani with the broken window theory. You know, I mean, you know, you, you, get, you, you patch the window so it doesn't become a derelict house and then become a crack house. And, you know, you, you paint over the graffiti right away. Um, it seems common sense, uh, but only once that you've arrived at it. And again, my experience is that it's those types of endeavors uh, that are the, are the difference should the opportunity come. The other is, frankly, you know, there are lots of people that say that, you know, Petraeus got lucky over the years, and that's undeniable. Timing does matter. But the truth is that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And I really was determined deep inside to be as prepared as I possibly could if the moment ever came uh, where they say, okay, you know, you're, you're calling your number and you're going into the game. And, you know, when it came to the surge in Iraq, I mean, we were down. It was late in the fourth quarter. <laughs> And, um, and but, but again, we were ready for that. We'd spent years there already. We did the counterinsurgency field manual. We overhauled everything in the Army and the Marine Corps to prepare our leaders, our forces, our, our individuals, our staffs to go over there, changed equipment, organizational structures, policies, and so forth. Uh, and, and we were ready. And the, the timing was there. And, and again, the entire force was ready. Uh, this is one of those things where, you know, you, you say, look, it was a privilege to be the coach. Um, but as, as Yogi Berra said, you know, it's, all, it's also about the team. And it really is. And I was privileged to be part of some great teams, to be the coach of some of those, uh, to be in the ranks of some others where we were together and some of the others here tonight were together. And it's also been a privilege to be here on stage with you tonight after this wonderful uh, endeavor that you put together, Tom. Thank you Thank very you, much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being here tonight to support the children of fallen patriots. Thank you to the General Petraeus, Colonel Jack Jacobs, and Secretary Donovan. Thank you all very much, and have a good night.